Revelation 9. I mentioned uh, last Sunday morning that at this part right here, something happens that has never happened on the earth before. And to my knowledge, never will happen again. Uh, it's an, it's an, it is a supernatural event in that only a supernatural source could ever produce something like this. Let me ask you a question. How much power does the devil have uh, over people in general? Huh? As much as God allows. That's a good answer. Um, and depending on what God allows, we know that um, we know that the devil and devils, um, we know that they can uh, kill or have people killed. Uh, we also know that um, the devil has the ability to afflict the human body because of what happened to Job. We also know then that the devil has the ability to kill the human body because God specifically told Satan not to, uh, not to kill him. He could afflict his body in whatever way he wanted, but he could not kill him. Um, we know also that, um, and I'm going to preach uh, a sermon series starting this morning on, and I call it the battlefield of the mind. And I was really, uh, once I started studying this, I couldn't stop. Um, have you ever wondered why we think some of the things that we do? Why certain ideas just roll into our head? Uh, usually things that are not good. Um, and how much control spirits have over our minds. Um, and I'll just say this, uh, without a doubt, um, every sin that a person commits starts right here. It starts right here. Anybody says, well, before I knew what was happening, boom, I did this. Uh-uh. It was here first. The mind controls the body. And the body doesn't move unless the mind says, we're going to do this. So that's um, something we're going to start this morning. Go ahead. Let's pray for you right now, okay? Father, you know what's going on with Gary. And Lord, you know the, the battle that he is dealing with right now. And Lord, I pray for my brother. I pray, dear God, for him because when or if I'm ever in that condition, I'd want him praying for me. And Father, I've had that. I've had times where my mind just wasn't good. And you sent people to pray for me or you had people online that just call me and say, Pastor, we're praying for you. Don't know why. So, Father, I pray to your God that you'd bless our friend and brother. And God, that you'd help him this morning. And Lord, just give him grace. And Lord, whatever the devil is trying to say to him or do to him, and pray, Father, that you'd make it go away. Uh, your word promises us that you have not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So, Father, to each one of us, and Lord, maybe even somebody online, Lord, maybe this is happening because somebody watching this morning is going through a very, very difficult time. So, Father, I pray, God, that you would bless both him and anyone else watching, Lord, that is just really struggling today. 
Give them grace. Give them comfort. Bless them, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I love it. God makes promises and He don't break them. Amen. Uh, by the way, I got something neat to share. We have a family that uh, has followed our ministry for years. And um, his mother passed away. Um, she, was, uh, she was a saint. And she's in heaven now. And uh, he sent me a note yesterday asking to pray that they were having her memorial service yesterday. So I said that I would, and praying for him and his family, his family, him and his wife, they're going through a tough time with their kids. And um, so anyway, he sent me word back. To, I've been to enough funerals and preached enough funerals. But when I, when I go to a funeral of somebody I don't know, uh, and there's a, or somebody I do know, and there's a preacher there, I've heard so many preachers preach everybody into heaven everybody's going to heaven nobody nobody's suffering nobody's hurting nobody's in torments nobody is you hear people stand up next to the casket oh he's in a better place oh they're not suffering now she's she's doing well now she's up there with daddy and so on and so on and I just hear that and when I preach a funeral if I if I don't know for a fact they're in heaven I don't say they're in a better place or they're in heaven or they're not suffering anymore because if they're in hell, they're suffering. Uh, what I do is I give the gospel and I say something like this. If so-and-so were standing here in this room today, they would tell you to trust Jesus with all your heart. Okay? Whether, if they're in hell, I don't say this, but if they're in hell, they would tell you that. If they're in heaven, they would tell you that. So, um, he writes me back this morning, and apparently, whoever led the memorial service did it right. Because he said several people made a decision to get saved. This funeral! Amen! Amen. And he said, I was dreading this because this is a hard, rough bunch that was going to show up for this. And he said, several of them gave their life to the Lord. Woo! Amen. All right. But anyway, I'm going to preach, start preaching a message series on the mind this morning. And like I said, when I started really getting into it in the scriptures, man, I couldn't stop studying. So anyway, all right, Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. The fifth angel sounded. I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Uh, again, I believe that that's, uh, I believe that's Satan. And um, I don't know if I covered this last week, but let's look at Isaiah 14 just very quickly. I don't remember if I went to it or not. But I'll give you my reasoning here why I believe that this star, this angel. Uh, number one, we know what it says in verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? When you go back to Revelation 9, the fifth angel sounded and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Stars are angels. They are the heavenly powers. Uh, heavenly luminaries or whatnot. And then if we read before and after that in Isaiah 14, verse 10, all they shall speak and say unto thee, art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down and we know pomp is related to pride and we know pride was the sin that Satan committed in Ezekiel 28. Um, thy pomp is brought down to the grave. And the noise of thy vials in musical instruments. The worm is spread under thee. And the worms cover thee. That's the grave. Now if you look in um, verse uh, 14. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. In verse 15, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell 
to the sides of the pit. Uh, we know that an angel is going to come with a great iron chain and bind Satan and cast him into the very pit that I believe he opens. Verse 16, They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake the kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof? Do you know what's happening in most large cities in America right now? It's bad. Um, I watch a lot of um, police channels on, on YouTube, body cameras and so on. And I am like amazed. These cops that work these cities, I don't see how they do it anymore. Because especially during COVID, if they arrested 100 people that day, 99 people got let out the same day. 99 people didn't even have to post bond that day. Um, but generally, in most large cities, and I'd say probably over 50,000, the drug addicts all gang up in the city park. Activists buy them tents to live in and set the tents up in um, urban centers like city parks, places where you would used to take your kid to go play and play frisbee and softball and all that stuff. You can't do that anymore. They deliberately set these tents up in places that they know is going to make everybody mad and then dare you to complain about it. And, they, when they, and, and once those tents get filled, they go out and they get George Soros money and buy more tents and set them up in different places so that will attract the homeless and the drug addicts. And then you got people giving them free needles. You got people, you got people bringing drugs into those places for them so they don't have to go out and buy it somewhere. You just give it to them. And um, it's sickening. It is absolutely sickening. The devil is destroying our cities. And it's all over the world. Um, but anyway, they that, uh, verse, yeah, and destroyed the cities thereof that opened not the house of his prisoners. All the kings and the nations, even all them lie in glory, everyone in his own house. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch, and as the remnant, uh, as the raiment of those that are slain, thrust through with the sword that go down to the stones of the pit, as a carcass trodden under feet. And I'll just stop reading there. But anyway, I, I think that this angel, this star, um, could very well be Lucifer, just, just by the description. Um, we know that he wants that pit open because he knows what's down there. So he opens the pit, verse 2, and he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the... What's that going to do to the global warming? Climate change. Um... The sun and air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And again, these are not ordinary locusts. And unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth. And if you want to underline that, because we're going to see that again in a different place in the Bible. Neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days, here it is, 
shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. Now, verse uh, 5 and verse 6 together tells us that there's coming a time. It's not happened yet, but it's going to happen. And it's going to be unmistakable when it happens. These locusts with scorpion stings in their tails, we'll see the description once we get into verse 7, but these locusts with scorpion stings in their tails, they sting everybody on the earth except those who have the seal of God and the grass of the earth. And I'll show you what that means in a little bit. When they do, it does something to them so that for five months, nobody anywhere dies of anything. No one does. Look at that, what it says. It was given to them that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And in verse 6, and in those days, that five-month period, 150 days, shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. So, Right. Those who are not sealed, those who are not uh, the grass of the earth, I'll tell you what it means in a minute. Those who are, have not been sealed, in other words, all the wicked of the earth. And think about, let's go back to, um, oh, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, but go to, um, yeah, Genesis 3. The promise that the serpent made to Eve, thus to mankind. Eve, of, Eve is the mother of all living. The lie that he told her. That it was possible for man not to die. So, Genesis 3 verse 4. This is part of what the serpent said. First of all, he said, Yea, hath God said. Um, and then he said in verse 4, The serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. He's making a promise of immortality to her. Uh, who's ever heard of the fountain of youth? Okay. What was, uh, what was uh, Cortez looking for? He's looking for the fountain of youth. Um, who was it landed in Florida? Ponce de Leon. He was looking for the fountain of youth. He had heard that it was over here somewhere. And so he went around looking for it. Okay. He ended up at St. Augustine. Mama. That was her and dad's favorite place to go. Um, but yeah, he searched all through Florida. Heard tales of it. Heard stories of it, the Indian myths and legends and so on, and and uh, went looking for it because he thought, man, if that's true, then my goodness, the Holy Grail. Who's ever heard of the Holy Grail? If you watched Indiana Jones, you know about the Holy Grail. The Holy Grail is supposed to be the cup, uh, two stories about it. One, that it was the cup that Jesus drank from at the Last Supper. Um but we don't have a cup that Jesus drank from at the Last Supper. Why? Jesus didn't drink at the Last Supper. He gave the wine to his disciples and he said, Drink ye all of it. I will not drink until I drink it anew with my Father in heaven. So there is no such thing as a holy cup that Jesus drank from at the Last Supper. It doesn't exist. But they say there is, but that's just like a cover story. The second story is that Joseph of Arimathea had the cup and he held it under the cross when they pierced Christ's side and blood and water issued forth. 
And he captured in that cup the blood of Jesus. And when it became known that he had Jesus' blood in a cup, he knew that he had to protect it. So the legend is that he got on a ship and it sailed all the way to England and Joseph of Arimathea took the cup and he threw it into um, a, a well in England. And that well is still there. You can go there and it's got all these symbols around it and this sort of reddish water comes, comes out of this well. It's probably got a lot of iron in it or something like that. Uh, anyway, they call it the Grail Well or the Grail Spring. And people go there literally to bathe in this water or drink this water because they think it'll renew them and revitalize them and blah, blah, blah. But that's what people believe. And then, of course, people have been searching for... In, uh, our whole um, chemistry, industry, chemistry, science... Uh, chemistry uh, teachings in universities, most of our chemistry or uh, whatever studies came from the early alchemists. Alchemists were supposedly, we were told in school, that they were looking for a way to turn lead into gold. But that was just a cover. That was a veil. What they were really looking for was a way to turn mortals into immortals. Lead into gold, humans who die into gods who don't die. There was a famous alchemist by the name of Nicholas Flamel. Nicholas Flamel shows up in the uh, very first Harry Potter book. And supposedly the story is that Nicholas Flamel lived about 700 years because he had discovered this uh, alchemist holy grail. He had discovered the way uh, to transmute himself and become a god. And so he lived about 700 years. I'll give you um, the name of another famous alchemist who lived and was trying to find the key to immortality. His name was Blanche Devereaux. Does that name ring a bell? You ever watch the Golden Girls? Yeah. Blanche, that's where they got the name, Blanche Devereaux. It's from a famous alchemist who was trying to find a way to live immortality. There's more about that. I won't get into it. But anyway, so people have been looking for this holy grail, this way, this key to immortality. So now we live in the 21st century. Now we live... And I've been seeing this coming. I've been watching it. That's what a watchman does. And warning people that in a few years, we would have artificial intelligence that is equal first to our own intelligence, then would surpass our intelligence. And right now, from uh, all the indications... Right now, we have artificial intelligence that equals human intelligence. In fact, there is a warning now going out to people all over the world. Warning, you know how you get a call from this guy named Gary, but his name really isn't Gary because he's a guy from India and you can tell by his accent, hello, my name is Gary and I am from the, I am from the Microsoft and we have a problem with your computer. We'd like to fix that. We need access to your computer. Okay? Those are scammers, right? Well, you can tell when they send you an email because half the stuff in that email is misspelled because they don't know English very well. With artificial intelligence, all they have to do is use chat GPT, artificial intelligence, to have them rewrite their script so that it sounds like how Americans talk. So now you're you're closer to accepting it. The second problem is, is that artificial intelligence can learn and mimic anybody's voice. Anybody's voice. 
All they need is a sample of you talking online. Oops. I talk online six, seven times a week, every week. So what happens is my mom could get a phone call in my voice saying, Mom, I am in trouble. I need you to meet me. I need money. Can you bring such and such money or can you, can you wire this money to such and such? And it's my voice. And she can't tell the difference. And so what is she going to do? Send the money. Let me die. Yes. No. Oh, it's being used now. And on top of that, this is what scares me. On top of that, they can now make a video of you talking. Can't tell. I'm sure it did. I'm sure it did, because it now is on par with human intelligence. The next step is higher intelligence. But these scientists, medical professionals, they don't have a problem with this, because they're saying, oh, we're using artificial intelligence to help us diagnose diseases, and to help us do this, and to help us do that, and because they have access to all these databases, they can now pinpoint exactly what your problem is, we can come up with a cure. Here's the problem. Now the cure is coming in the form of uh, mixing your body with technology or genetically altering your DNA to take out things that would cause diseases. Uh, Sterling has heart issues in his family. You had a sister that died of a heart attack. Who else? Did Robert die of a heart attack? Heart problems? Yeah. Okay. Sterling, Sterling's had to have a... And cancer. He's got cancer in his family. Sterling's had dealings with cancer. And so now they could say, we can cure that. We can alter your genes so that you won't get cancer. You won't have heart problems anymore. We can, we can do that. And at first it would be voluntary, but then it won't be. It'll be your insurance company saying, you either do this or we drop you. Okay? And this stuff, I've been telling about this stuff for years. It's coming. Uh, this was the cover of Time Magazine. This came out, uh, let's see, what year? 2011. Ray Kurzweil, who works for Google now, and he is their, um, one of their scientists in charge of looking into the future to see what's coming. Head of Research and Development. Ray Kurzweil predicted that by 2045, man would have the ability then to live forever, to be a god. Because gods don't die. And that's, that's where we're headed. Um, this article came out in 2019. Human merger with machines will create a hybrid race of super gods says top expert. Here's another one. Uh, 2017, super intelligence and eternal life. Transhumanism's faithful follow, uh, transhumanism's faithful follow it blindly into a future for the elite. And so what will happen is those people with money, the Steve, uh, Steve Jobs, he's dead, um, which they could probably resurrect Steve Jobs. He's been dead for years. Um, people like uh, Bill Gates, people like Elon Musk, people like Donald Trump, anybody that's rich and wealthy, the elite, they can have themselves augmented or altered either with technology or genetic uh, modification to rule out their possibility of them dying of any disease. Um, they can cure Alzheimer's. 
all kinds of disease that are genetically related, they can modify you and they can cure those diseases. And so take away anything in you that could possibly die. This was science fiction, but now it's science fact. Yes, mom. Oh. Well, you can't. So now let's go back to uh, these scorpions. Uh, the Bible mentions scorpions a few times, not a lot. But um, here's what somebody asked a while ago. Is this just for those who do not have the seal of God? Uh, yes, it's only for them. Think of, um, think of Israel in the land of Goshen. When Israel was in Goshen, they were protected. Even when the darkness fell on the Egyptians, and it was so dark, the Bible says they could feel the darkness. And yet in Goshen, it's like you walk out through a wall of darkness into Goshen and you're in light now. The Israelites didn't have that problem. When the, um, when the disease afflicted all the cattle, and all the cattle died, didn't afflict the Jews in Goshen, when the flies came, the flies covered everything, didn't bother the Jews in Goshen, they were protected from these things. God would not allow anything to afflict His people. So, in this sense here, uh, God talks about how in Deuteronomy 8, He led them through that great and terrible wilderness wherein were fiery serpents. Those are spirits. The word fiery there tells you that they are the seraphim uh, type of spirits. They're, they're made of fire. They're uh, fiery serpents and scorpions. And I don't believe they were just normal scorpions. I think they were spirits, devils. And drought where there was no water who brought thee forth water out of the rock of Flint. So clearly I think these are spirits. In 1 Kings... When Rehoboam, who was Solomon's son, after Solomon died, remember the people of the land came to Rehoboam and they said, you know, your father was a great man, he built all this stuff, but our taxes are too high. Will you lower our taxes? And Rehoboam went to the elder men and they said, you know what? You lower these people's taxes, they'll love you forever. But his younger friends who wanted to live off his money said, I wouldn't lower taxes, I'd raise it. And so Rehoboam followed them and he spake after the counsel of the young men, 1 Kings 12, my father made your yoke heavy and I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. He was talking about devils, spirits. Ezekiel 2, a promise made to Ezekiel. And thou son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns be with thee, spirits, and thou dost dwell among scorpions, be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. In other words, God is saying he is going to protect Ezekiel from the scorpions. Jesus said the same thing. Luke chapter 10, verse 17. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Devils. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now think about what we just read in Revelation 9. I saw a star fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents, which are spirits, and scorpions, spirits. And over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Amen. Say amen to that. Amen. I'm telling you. No, God is telling you. Do not fear what man can do to you. Do not be in fear of 
what's on the people on the internet will tell you you can't you can't get vaccinated you can't take these medicines you can't eat this genetically modified food you can't do any of this stuff because if you do you'll take the mark it'll change your dna and you'll lose your salvation and and god won't have anything to do with you it won't happen like that god Prompt Jesus promised us, our Savior promised us, I will not let them hurt you. I don't go around looking for snakes to walk on. Or scorpions. But I'm telling you, God's going to allow us to tread on scorpions. Devils. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Amen? And yet people go around bragging, Oh, I, I cast out devils, and I did this, and I, boy, I tell you what, the devils don't like to see me come in a room. He said, don't boast on that. But be thankful that your name is written in heaven. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings. Upon your word today, Father, we ask, Lord, that you open our eyes, open up our hearts. Father, help us to see, uh, Lord, the things that are coming before they ever come. That's what this book is, a sure word of prophecy. We ask your blessings on it in Jesus' name. Amen.